This report is about Section 3, Privacy of Communication and Correspondence. Uh, still in Article 3, Bill of Rights of the 1987 Constitution. Just a disclaimer that this video and the resources, um, the resources came from my classmates in Constitutional Law 2 in San Beda, Alabang. And I'm just uh, reporting this for review purposes. The first case is the case of Navarro versus Court of Appeals. In the facts of the case, Stanley Galbuena, Ikelingan, and Mario Ilagan were reporters in DWTI in Lucena who went to Entertainment City. <coughs> um, Halbuena took a picture and the floor manager, Dante Liquin, demanded to know why he took a picture. Halbuena and his companions went to the police station in which Felipe Navarro was on duty. Navarro had a talk with Lequeen and Shoko, then went back to Halbuena and pulled out his firearm. Lingan intervened and had a heated exchange with Navarro. <coughs> Navarro hit Lingan with the handle of the pistol and Lingan fell to the floor. Lava <coughs> Navarro hit him again when he tried to get up. Navarro turned to Halbuena and made him sign his name on the blotter. Lingan died from his injuries. Unknown to Navarro, Halbuena had been able to record on tape the exchange between the petitioner and deceased. Navarro claims it was um, deceased who tried to hit him twice, but Lingan uh, still hit his head on the concrete. RTC found him guilty of homicide and the CA affirmed. He questioned the validity of the tape recording as a violation of the wiretapping law. So the issue is whether or not the recording by Halbuena is a violation of RA number 4200 which prohibits wiretapping. Held, no, it was not a violation of RA 4200. The law prohibits overhearing of recording um, re or recording of private communications. Since the exchange between the parties was not private, the tape recording is not prohibited. The voice recording is also duly authenticated because he personally recorded the conversation. The tape played in court is the one he recorded and the voices on the tape are those of the persons claimed to belong. Held, the recording of Halbuena established that there was a heated exchange between Navarro and Lingan. Some form of violence occurred between the two. In establishing the validity of the testimony and recording, there is no constitutional violation of privacy, and Navarro is found to be guilty of homicide. In the case of Ople v. Torres, this is a petition raised by Senator Blas Ople to invalidate the Administrative Order No. 308, also known as the Adoption of a National Computerized Identification Reference System, issued by President Fidel V. Ramos on December 12, um, 1996. The petitioner contends that the implementation of the said AO will violate the rights of the citizens of privacy as guaranteed by the Constitution. He contends that the order must be invalidated on two constitutional grounds, that it is a, new, a usurpation of the power to legislate and that it intrudes the citizens' right to privacy. We grant the petition for the rights sought to be vindicated by the petitioner needs strong barriers against further erosion. One of the contention of the petitioner is that the implementation of AO number 308 insidiously lays the groundwork for a system which will violate the Bill of Rights enshrined in the Constitution. Respondents counter argue AO number 308 protects an individual interest in privacy, and we now resolve the case. The issue is whether or not number 308 violates the right of privacy. Yes. 
Yes, Administrative Order Number 308 violates the right to privacy, and the right to privacy is one of the most threatened rights of man living in a mass society. The threats emanate from various sources such as the government's employer, uh, journalists, employers, social scientists, and the essence of privacy is the right to be let alone. The right to privacy is a fundamental right guaranteed by the Constitution. The AO number 308 violates the constitutional right to privacy because its scope is too broad and vague that will put people's right to privacy in clear and present danger if implemented. The AO number 308 also lacks proper safeguards for protecting the information that will be gathered from people through biometrics and other means. It may also enable unscrupulous persons to access confidential information and circumvent the right against self-incrimination. In the case at bar, the threat comes from the executive branch of government, by uh, which by issuing AO number 308, pressures the people to surrender their privacy by giving information about themselves on the pretext that it will facilitate delivery of basic services. <clears throat> Given the record-keeping power of the computer, only the indifferent fail to perceive the danger that AO number 308 gives the government the power to compile a devastating dossier against unsuspecting citizens. Therefore, Administrative Order number 308 violates the right to privacy. It is declared null and void for being unconstitutional. In the case of Alejano v. Kaubuay, in July 2003, and some 321 armed soldiers led by the now-detained junior officers entered and took control of the Oakwood Premier Luxury Apartments, an upscale apartment complex located in the business district of Makati. The soldiers disarmed the security officers of Oakwood and planted explosive devices in its immediate surroundings. The junior officers publicly renounced that their support for the administration and called for the resignation of President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo and seven, several cabinet members. Around 7 p.m. of the same date, the soldiers voluntarily surrendered to the authorities after several negotiations with government emissaries. The soldiers later defused the explosive devices they had earlier planted. The soldiers then returned to their barracks. General Abaya, as the chief of staff of the AFP, issued a directive to all the major service commanders to turn over custody of 10 junior officers to the ISAFP detention center. August 2003, government prosecutors filed an information for coup d'etat and the petitioners filed a petition for habeas corpus. A uh, court of appeal said habeas corpus is an unavailing in this case as the detainee's confinement is under a valid indictment, the legality for which the detainees and petitioners do not even question. The appellate court um, declared that while the reopening and reading of Terliana's letter is an abhorrent violation of his right to privacy of communication, this does not justify the read of a for a habeas corpus. The violation does not amount to illegal restraint, which is the proper subject of habeas corpus proceedings. The issue is whether the opening inspection and reading of the letter of the detainees is an infringement of a citizen's privacy right. And the ruling of the Supreme Court is that they do not agree with the Court of Appeals that the opening and reading of the detainee's letters in the present case violated the detainee's right to privacy of communication. In Palmigiano v. Travisono, incoming mail may be inspected for contraband and read in certain instances. Outgoing mail of the pre-trial detainees could not be inspected or read at all. In Wolf v. McDonnell, Prison officials could open in the presence of the inmates incoming mail from attorneys to, uh, to inmates. However, prison officials could not read such mail from attorneys. In Bell v. Wolfish reasoned that those who are detained prior to trial may in many cases be individuals who are charged with serious crimes or who have prior records and may therefore pose a greater risk of escape than convicted inmates. 
result in summary incoming mail from lawyers of inmates enjoy prote uh, limited protection from uh, such that pres pres prison officials can open and inspect the mail only for contraband but could not read the contents without violating the inmate's rights to correspond with his lawyer. The inspection of privileged mail is limited to physical contraband and not to verbal contraband. <coughs> Held in the present case, since the letters were not confidential communication between the detainees and their lawyers, the officials of the ISAFP detention center could read the letters. If the letters are marked confidential communication between the detainees and the lawyers, the detention official should not read the letters but only open the envelopes for inspection of any contraband <coughs> in the presence of the detainees. The letters alleged to have been read by the ISAFP authorities were not confidential letters between the detainees and their lawyers. The petitioners were, uh, who received the letters from detainees, Trillanes and Maestro Campo, was merely acting as the detainees in personal career and not as their counsel when he received the letters for mailing. The letters were not in a sealed envelope. The inspection of the folded letters is a valid measure as it serves the same purpose as the opening of sealed letters for the inspection of contraband. In the case of KMU versus Director General NEDA, on April 13, 2005, President Arroyo issued an Executive Order No. 420 directing a unified ID system among the various government agencies and GOCCs for the purpose of having a uniform ID for all government agencies. Kilosang Mayo Uno and others assailed EO420 for being an, a usurpation of legislative powers by the President and it, it infringes <coughs> the citizens' right to privacy. Petitioners allege that EO420 is a void based on one of the following grounds, that EO420 violates the constitutional provisions and the right to privacy. It allows access to personal confidential data without the owner's consent without the owner's consent and EO420 is vague and without adequate safeguard or penalties for any violation of its provisions there are no compelling reasons that will legitimize the necessity of EO420 Hence, the court takes cognizance of the petitions. The issue, whether or not EO420 on Unified ID System among government agencies infringes on the right to privacy. Held, no. EO420 on Unified ID System among... Where's that? Okay. No EO420 on unified ID system among government agencies does not infringe the citizen's right to privacy. The purposes of the uniform ID data collection and ID format are to reduce costs, achieve efficiency and reliability, and ensure compatibility and provide convenience to the people served by the government entities. All these years, the GSIS, SSS, LTO, PhilHealth, and other government entities have been issuing ID cards in the performance of their governmental functions. There have been no complaints from citizens that the ID cards of these government entities violate the right to privacy and in the collection and recording of personal identification. 
on its face, EO 420 shows no constitutional infirmity because it even narrowly limits the data that can be collected, recorded, and shown compared to the existing IDs of government entities. Moreover, EO number 420 applies only to government entities that already maintain ID systems and issue ID cards pursuant to their regular functions under existing laws. EO number 420 does not grant such government entities any power that they do not already possess under existing laws. In the present case, EO 420 does not establish a national ID system but makes the existing sectoral card systems of government entities like SSS, GSIS, PhilHealth, and LTO less costly, more efficient, reliable, and user-friendly to the public. Therefore, EO number 420 on unified ID system among government agencies does not infringe the citizens' right to privacy. In Polo versus Constantino Dash David, uh, the facts of the case are Petitioner is a former supervising personal specialist of the CSC, Regional Office No. 4, and also the officer in charge of the Public Assistance and Liaison Division. Under the Mamamayan Muna Hindi Mamayana program of the CSC, an unsigned letter complaint addressed to respondent CSC. Chairperson Karina Constantino David, the letter contained information about an employee of CSC which also acted as a lawyer of an accused government employee having a pending case in the CSC. Chairperson David immediately formed a team of four personnel with background on information technology and issued a memo directing them to conduct an investigation and specifically to back up all the files in the computers found in the Mamamayan, Muna, PALD, and Legal Divisions. The next day, all the computers in the PALD were sealed and secured for the purpose of preserving all the files stored therein. Several diskettes containing the backup files sourced from the hard disk were turned over to Chairperson David. It was found that most of the files in the 17 diskettes containing files were draft pleadings or letters in connection with administrative cases in the CSC and other tribunals. On the basis of this finding, Chairperson David issued the show cause order. The petitioner filed his comment denying that he is the person referred to in the anonymous letter complaint which had no attachments to it because he is not a lawyer and neither is he lawyering for people with cases in the CSC. He accused CSC officials of conducting a phishing expedition when they unlawfully copied and printed personal files in his computer and subsequently asking him to submit his comment which violated his right against self-incrimination. The issue is whether or not petitioner is entitled to avail the right to privacy over his computer and electronic files as a government employee. Held, no, the court made an analysis on the landmark case of O'Connor v. Ortega and United States v. Simons, laying the principle of balancing the right to privacy by an employee against searches made by the employer who in this case is also the government. According to the court, O'Connor emphasized that the probable cause requirement for searches of the type at issue here would impose intoler intolerable burdens on public employers. The delay in correcting the employee misconduct caused by the need for probable cause rather than reasonable suspicion will be translated into tangible and often irreparable damage to the agency's work and ultimately to the public interest. Petitioner failed to prove that he had an actual expectation of privacy either in his office or government-issued computer, which contained his personal files. Petitioner did not allege that he had a separate and closed office, which he did not share with anyone, or that his office was always locked and not open to other employees or visitors. Neither did he allege that the he used passwords or adopted any means to prevent other employees from accessing his computer files. On the contrary, he submits that being in the public assistance office of the CSCROIV, he normally would have visitors in his office like friends, associates, and even unknown people whom he even allowed to use his computer, which to him seemed a trivial request. Care must be therefore be made in ensuring that a standard of reasonableness, there must be reasonable grounds present before the exemption may be applied 
such as suspecting that the search will turn up evidence that the employee is guilty of work-related misconduct or that the search is necessary for a non-investigatory work-related purpose such as to retrieve a needed file. The CSC in this case had implemented a policy that put its employees on notice that they have no expectation of privacy in anything they create, store, send, or receive on office computers, <coughs> and that CSC may monitor the use of computer resources, both automated or by human means. An office memorandum 2002 computer use policy explicitly provided for such. This implied, therefore, that on-the-spot inspections may be done to ensure that the u- that computer resources were used only for such legit- legitimate business purposes. <laughs> The search of petitioner's computer files was conducted in connection with investigation of work-related misconduct uh, prompted by an anonymous letter complaint addressed to Chairperson David regarding anomalies in the CSC ROIV where the head of the Mamamayan Muna Hindi Mamayana Division is supposedly lawyering for individuals with pending cases in the CSC. A search by a government employer of an employee's office is justified at inception <coughs> when there are reasonable grounds for suspecting that it will turn up evidence that the employee is guilty of work-related misconduct. Petitioner's computer is government property and the use of which the CSC has absolute right to regulate and monitor. <coughs> Therefore, any evidence found on petitioner's computer is admissible against him. <laughs> Spouses Hing versus Chowa Choi Sr. On August 23, 2005, spouse, uh, petitioner spouses Bill and Victoria Hing filed RTC of Mandawe City, a complaint for injunction and damages with prayer for issuance of a writ of preliminary mandatory injunction temporary restraining order against respondents Alexander Chowa Choi Sr. and Alan Chowa Choi. Petitioners are the registered owners of parcel of land situated in the city of Mandawe, Cebu. Petitioners are the owners of all the development resources adjacent to the property of petitioners that responded, constructed an auto repair building shop named Aldo Goodyear Servitec. Aldo claimed that petitioners were constructing a fence without a valid permit. Said construction would destroy the wall of its building, which is adjacent to petitioner's property. Aldos applied for preliminary injunction but was denied due failure to substantiate their allegations to get evidence to support the said case. Respondents illegally set up and installed on the building of Aldo Goodyear Servitec two video surveillance cameras facing petitioner's property. The respondents through their employees and without the consent of petitioners also took pictures of petitioner's ongoing construction and that the acts of respondents violate petitioner's right to privacy. Thus, petitioners prayed that the respondents be ordered to remove the video surveillance cameras and enjoin the conducting illegal surveillance. RTC granted the application for a TRO. Respondents moved for a reconsideration, but the RTC denied the same in its order. Aggrieved, respondents filed with the CA a petition for certiorari under Rule 65 of the Rules of Court with application for a TRO and or writ of preliminary injunction. The CA issued its decision granting the petition for certiorari. The CA ruled that the rate of preliminary injunction was issued with grave abuse of discretion because petitioners failed to show a clear and unmistakable right to an injunctive writ. The CA explained that the right to privacy of residents under Article 26 of the Civil Code was not violated since the property subject of the controversy is not used as a residence. The issue, whether or not the right to privacy of the spouses hang were violated. Yes, the right to privacy of the petitioners were violated. Defined as the right to be free from unwarranted exploitation of one's persons or from intrusion into one's private activities.
<clears throat> Again, it was held the right to privacy of the petitioners were violated, defined as the right to be free from unwarranted exploitation of one's person or from intrusion um, into one's private activities in such a way as to cause humiliation to a person's ordinary sensibilities. Article 26, every person shall respect the dignity, personality, privacy, and peace of mind of his neighbors and other persons. The following and similar acts, though they may not constitute a criminal offense, shall produce a cause of action for damages, prevention, and other relief. Prying into the privacy of another's residence, reasonable expectation of privacy, whether by his conduct the individual has exhibited the expectation of privacy, and this expectation is one that society recognizes as reasonable. Customs, community norms, and practices may therefore limit or extend an individual's reasonable expectation of privacy. The RTC thus considered that petitioners have a reasonable expectation of privacy in their property, whether they use it as business office or as a residence, and that the installation of video surveillance cameras directly facing petitioners' property or covering a significant portion thereof without their consent, is a clear violation of the right to privacy. As we see then, the issuance of a preliminary injunction was justified. In the case of Vivares versus uh, St. Teresa's College, graduating high school students who are minors took pictures of themselves in their undergarment. These pictures were uploaded on FB by Angela Tan. A computer teacher named Mylene Reza T. Esquedro discovered the, pic the pictures from her students. <laughs> the photos were reported to Christine Rose Teagle, STC's discipline in charge, and the uh, um, girls were found to have violated the student handbook. On March 1, 2012, Julia, Julian, Angela, and the other students in the pictures in question reported as required to the office of um, Senior Celeste Maria Porisipa, STC's high school principal and ICM directors. They were also banned from commencement. Angela's mother, Dr. Amer Armenia Tan, filed a petition for injunction and damages asking that the school be denied from prohibiting the girls from attending commencement. Despite the issuance of the TRO, STC nevertheless barred the sanctioned students from participating in the graduation rights. Thereafter, petitioners filed before the RTC a petition for the issuance of a writ of habeas data. The RTC dismissed the petition for habeas data because petitioners failed to prove the existence of an actual or threatened violation of the minor's right to privacy. Petitioners now come before this court pursuant to Section 19 of the Rule on Habeas Data. The issue is whether or not there was an actual threatened violation of the right to privacy in life, liberty, or security of the minors involved in this case and held that no, there was no actual or threatened violation of the right to privacy in life, liberty, or security of the minors involved in this case. In former Chief Justice Reynato Puno's speech, he explained the three strands of the right to privacy, the locational or situational privacy, informational privacy, and decisional privacy. Out of the three, what is relevant to the case at bar is the right to informational privacy. 
there was failure to establish that the uploading or showing the photos of Teagle constituted a violation of their privacy. In this case, the core issue was the right to informational privacy defined as the right of individuals to control information about themselves. To what extent should the right to privacy be protected in online social networks and whose sole purpose is sharing information over the web? The petitioners argued that the privacy settings on Facebook limit who can see what information. This give users a subjective expectation of privacy. In the present case, STC did not violate their students' privacy since the manner in which they acquired the photo was not illegal. The setting of photos' privacy to friends only is no assurance that it can no longer be viewed by another user who is not a Facebook friend with the source of the content. The user's own Facebook can share said content or tag others regardless of whether the user tagged by the latter is Facebook friends or not with the former. Therefore, there was no actual or threatened violation of the right to privacy in the life, liberty, or security of the minors involved in this case. In the case of Christian Kadahas ver- uh, e. Cabias versus People of the Philippines, Christian Kadahas met the victim who was only 14 years old at the time in the canteen where he works. He courted the petitioner and they became sweethearts. The mother of the victim learned of this and admonished them. The mother learned he was inviting her daughter to a motel and told him to stay away because she was a minor. The victim sent photos to petitioner and the victim's sister was able to get a copy of the conversation. Petitioner admitted to sending messages but denied sending photos of his private part. On the same day, petitioner broke up with the victim because her mother did not like him. He later learned two criminal cases were filed against him, violation of um, RA 7610, Special Protection of Children Against Abuse, Exploitation and Discrimination, and Child Pornography under um, RA 10175 or Cyber Crime Prevention Act of 2012. RTC acquitted the petitioner for the first charge but guilty for the second. CA affirmed the judgment and did not entertain the sweetheart defense as the violation is malum prohibitum. <laughs> The issue is whether or not the evidence presented are inadmissible for violating petitioner's right to privacy. No, the evidence was not inadmissible. Petitioner states that the evidence taken from his Facebook Messenger account is a violation of his privacy. It amounts to the fruit of a poisonous tree. And the court disagrees. The evidence was not taken by the state but by a private individual and the constitutional right of privacy is against the state or any agent of the state. The admissibility of evidence cannot be determined by the provisions of the Bill of Rights when pertaining to private individual relationships. Held further, even if it is granted that there was a violation of privacy between individuals, it could not be granted the same. The case of Ople versus Torres provides the reasonable expectation of privacy test, which is whether by his conduct, the individual has exhibited an expectation of privacy. This expectation is one society recognizes as reasonable. <laughs> Petitioner in this case provided his password and logged into the victim. He gave her authority of access to his account, even if the victim's sibling forced the victim to open the account. It does not deviate that petitioner allowed another person to access his account. U.S. versus O'Brien and David O'Brien and three companions burned their selective service registration certificates on the step of the South Boston Courthouse. This event was witnessed by the crowd, including FBI agents. They were subsequently attacked by the crowd and were ushered by the FBI inside the courthouse. He was tried and convicted by the U.S. District of Massachusetts. He did not contest the fact that he burned the certificate. He did this to influence others to adopt his anti-war beliefs, and he violated part of the Universal Military Training and Service Act of 1948, who amended in 1965, which punishes one who forges, alters, knowingly destroys, knowingly mutilates a selective service uh, registration certification. O'Brien argued that the amendment in 1965 prohibiting the destruction of the certificate is unconstitutional because it was enacted to abridge free speech and serves no legislative, legit, legitimate legislative purpose. District Court held that it was not constitutional, unconstitutional because it did not, on its face, abridge the First Amendment rights and that courts <clears throat> are not competent 
to inquire on the motives of Congress, and it was an exercise of the power of Congress to raise armies. This was reversed by the Court of Appeals. Both the U.S. government and O'Brien brought the case to the SC. Whether the 1965 amendment is unconstitutional because burning the card was protected symbolic speech within the First Amendment, and the Supreme Court held that no, the amendment was not unconstitutional. The court held that even if the conduct is labeled as speech, it does not necessarily follow that the destruction of a uh, registration certificate is constitutionally protected activity. The court applied that a government regulation is sufficiently justified if it is within the go- constitutional power of the government. The court applied this test. It for, uh, if it furthers an important of substantial governmental interest, if the interest in unrelated to suppression of free expression and if the un- incidental restriction is no greater than inessential to the furtherance of that interest. The amendment met all this requirement and O'Brien can be convicted for violating it. In Schenck v. U.S., Charles Schenck and Elizabeth Bayer were members of the Executive um, Committee of the Socialist Party in Philadelphia, of which Schenck was General Secretary. The Executive Committee authorized the Schenck oversaw printing and mailing more than 15,000 flyers to men uh, slated for conscription during World War I. The flyers urged men not to submit to the draft, saying do not submit to intimidation, assert your rights, etc. and urged men not to comply with the draft on the grounds that military conscription constituted involuntary servitude, which is prohibited by the 13th Amendment. Schenck and Bayer were convicted of violating Section 3 of the Espionage Act of 1917. Both defendants appealed to the the United States Supreme Court arguing that their conviction and the statute which purported to authorize it were contrary to the First Amendment. They relied heavily on the text of the First Amendment and their claim that the Espionage Act of 1917 had what today would call a chilling effect on free dis- um, discussion of the war effort. <coughs> the issue is whether or not Schenck's conviction was unconstitutional. Yes, the conviction was constitutional. The First Amendment did not protect speech encouraging men to resist induction. Because when a nation is at war, many things that might be said in time of peace are such a hindrance to its effort and that their utterance will not be endured so long as men fight and that no court could regard them as protected by any constitutional right. The court held the circumstances of wartime allow greater restrictions on free speech than would be allowed during peacetime if only because um, new and greater uh, dangers are present. The most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man in falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. The question in every case is whether the words used are used in such circumstances and are of such a nature as to create a clear and present danger that they will bring about the substantive evils that Congress has a right to prevent. It is a question of proximity and degree. In the case of United States v. Bustos, in 1915, 34 Pampanga residents signed a petition to the Executive Secretary regarding <coughs> charges against Roman Ponsalan, the Justice of the Peace of Macabebe. They wanted to oust him from his office. Specific allegations against him included bribery charges, involuntary servitude, and theft. The justice denied the charges. In the CFI, not all the charges were proved, but the judge still found him guilty. Justice Ponsalan filed charges alleging that he was the victim of prosecution and one Agustin Jaime, the Auxiliary Justice of Peace, instigated the charges against him for personal reasons. He was acquitted. The complaints 
The complainants filed an appeal to the Governor General but it wasn't acted upon. Criminal action was instituted against the residents by Ponsalan. The issue is whether or not the defendants and appellants are guilty of a libel of Roman Ponsalan, Justice of the Peace in Pampanga. No, the defendants were acquitted. In the usual case, malice can be presumed from defamatory words. <coughs> Privilege destroys that presumption and the burden of proving malice then lies on the plaintiff. The plaintiff must bring home to the defendant the existence of malice as the true motive of his conduct. Falsehood and the absence of probable cause will amount to proof of malice. As a general rule, words imputing to a judge or a justice of the peace, dishonesty, or corruption, or incapacity, or uh, misconduct touching him in his office are actionable. But as suggested in the beginning, we do not have present a simple case of direct and vicious accusations published in the press, but of charges predicated on affidavits made to the proper official and thus qualifiedly privileged. Express malice has not been proved by the prosecution. Further, although the charges are not pro are probably not true as to the justice of the peace, they were believed to be true by the petitioners. Good faith surrounded their action. Probable cause for them to think that malfeasance or misfeasance in the office existed in apparent. The Attorney General bases his recommendation for confirmation on the case of United States versus Julio Bustos. The Julio Bustos case is identical with the Felipe Bustos case with the exception that there has been more publicity in the present instance and that the person to whom the charge was made had less jurisdiction than that of the Secretary of Justice in Julio Bustos case. Publicity is immaterial if the charge against Ponsalan is in fact a privileged communication. Is in fact a privileged communication. In the case of um, People versus Alarcon, um, in relation to Section 4, Freedom of Expression, as an aftermath of the decision rendered by the Court of First Instance of Pampanga in Criminal Case 5733, the people of the Philippines versus Salvador Alarcon, et al., convicting the accused therein, except one of the crime of robbery committed in a band, a denunciatory letter signed by Luis M. Taruk was addressed to His Excellency, the President of the Philippines. A copy of said letter found its way to the herein respondent Federico Mangahas, who, as a columnist of the Tribune, a newspaper of general circulation in the Philippines, quoted the letter in an article published by him in the issue of that paper of September 23, 1937. The objectionable portion written in Spanish is inserted in the following petition of the Provincial Fiscal of Pampanga. Filed with the Court of First Instance of that province of Sep September 29, 1937. Um, facts on the same date, the lower court ordered the respondent to appear and show cause. The respondent appeared and filed an answer, alleging that the publication of the letter in question is in line with the constitutional guarantee of the freedom of the press. The issue is whether or not the publication of the letter in question is within the purview of constitutional guarantee of freedom of the press. Yes, the publication of the letter in question is within the purview of the constitutional guarantee of freedom of the press. The elements of contempt by newspaper publications are well defined by the cases adjudicated in this as in other jurisdictions. Newspaper publications tending to impede, obstruct, embarrass, or influence the court and administer, um, administering justice in a pending suit or proceeding. constitute criminal contempt which is summarily punishable by the courts. It must clearly appear that such publications do impede, interfere with, and embarrass the administration of justice between the author of the publication should be held for contempt. What is thus sought to be shielded against the influence of newspaper comments is the all-important duty of the court to administer justice in the decision of a pending case. Yes, and the publication of the letter in question is within the purview of constitutional guarantee of freedom of the press. Hence, the accused cannot be held guilty in contempt of court. 
<clears throat> in the case of Lagunzad versus Gonzales, sometime in August 1961, petitioner Manuel Lagunzad begun the production of a movie entitled The Moises Padilla Story. It was based mainly on the copyrighted but unpublished book of attorney Ernesto Rodriguez, entitled The Long Dark Night in Negro, subtitled The Moises Padilla Story. The book narrates the events which culminated in the murder of Moises Padilla, who was then a mayoralty candidate of the Nationalista Party for the municipality of Magallon, Negros Occidental, during the November 1951 elections. Governor Rafael Lacson, a member of the Liberal Party, then in power and his men were tried and convicted for that murder. In the book, Moises Padilla is portrayed as a martyr in contemporary political history. On October 5, 1961, Mrs. Nelly Amante, half-sister of Moises Padilla, for and in behalf of her mother, private respondent demanded in writing for certain changes. Corrections and deletions in the movie. On the same date, October 5, 1961, after some bargaining, the petitioner and private respondent executed a licensing agreement where the petitioner agreed to pay the private respondent the sum of 20,000 pesos payable without need of further demand. After its premiere showing on October 16, 1961, the movie was shown in different theaters all over the country. Because, because petitioner refused to pay any additional amounts pursuant to the agreement on December 22, 1961, private respondent instituted the present suit against him, praying for judgment in her favor. Petitioner contented in his answer that the episodes in the life of Moises Padilla depicted in the movie were matters of public knowledge. Whether or not the licensing agreement infringes on the constitutional right of freedom of speech and of the press. No, the prevailing doctrine is that the clear and present danger rule is such a limitation. Another criterion for permissible limitation on freedom of speech and of the press, which includes such vehicles of the mass media as radio, television, and the movies, is the balancing of interest test. The principle requires a court to take conscious and detailed consideration of the interplay of interests observable in a given situation or type of situation. <coughs> Taking into account the interplay of those interests, we hold that under the particular circumstances presented and considering the obligations assumed in the licensing agreement entered into by petitioner, the validity of such agreement will have to be upheld, particularly because the limits of freedom of expression are reached when expression touches upon matters of essentially private concern. In Ayer Productions PTY Limited vs. Kapulong, petitioner Michael Roy, an Australian filmmaker and his movie production company, Ayer Productions, envisioned sometime in 1987 for commercial viewing and for Philippine and international release, the historic peaceful struggle of the Filipinos at EDSA. The proposed motion picture entitled The Four-Day Revolution was endorsed by the MTRCB as a and other government agencies consulted. Ramos also signified his approval of the intended film production. It is designed to be viewed in a six-hour miniseries television play presented in a docudrama creating four fictional characters interwoven with real events and utilizing actual documentary footage as background. And really declared that he will not approve the use of his name or picture or that of any member of his family in any cinema or other medium for advertising or commercial exploitation. <coughs> Whether or not freedom of expression was violated. Yes, freedom of expression and um, and speech includes the freedom to film and produce motion pictures and exhibit such motion pictures in theaters or to diffuse them through television. Furthermore, the circumstance that the production of motion fic picture films is a commercial activity expected to yield monetary profit is not a disqualification for availing freedom of speech and of expression. The projected motion picture was as yet uncompleted and hence not exhibited to any audience. Neither private respondent nor the respondent trial judge knew what the completed film would precisely look like. There was, in other words, no clear and present danger of any violation of any right to privacy. Subject matter is one of public interest and concern. The subject thus relates to a highly critical stage in the history of the country. At all 
uh, relevant times during which the momentous events clearly of public concern that petitioners proposed to film were taking place and really was a public figure, such public figures were held to have lost to have some extent at least their right to privacy. The line of equilibrium in the specific context of the instant case between the constitutional freedom of speech and of expression and the right of privacy may be marked out in terms of a requirement that the proposed motion picture must be fairly truthful and historical in its presentation of events. There must be, in other words, be knowing or reckless disregard of truth in depicting the participation of private respondent in the ENSA revolution. In the case of Borjal v. Court of Appeals, Arturio Borjal, president of Philstar Daily Incorporated, owner of the Philippine star Maximo Soliven, publisher and chairman of its editorial board, Francisco Wenceslao, technical advisor of Congressman Season, then chairman of the HOR subcommittee in on industrial policy. During the congressional hearings in the transport crisis sometime in uh, September 1988 undertaken by the House Subcommittee on Industrial Policy, those who attended agreed to organize the first national conference on land transportation with the objective to draft an omnibus bill that would embody a long-term land transportation policy for presentation to Congress. According to Wenceslao, the conference would be funded through solicitations from various sponsors. Wenceslao was elected executive director. As such, he wrote numerous solicitation letters to the business community for the support of the conference. A series of articles written by Petitioner Burhal was published on different dates in his column, J. Walker. The articles dealt with the alleged anomalous activities of an organizer of a conference without naming or identifying private respondents, neither did it, it refer to the FNCLT as the conference therein mentioned or describe him as a self-proclaimed hero. A conference organizer associated with shady deals was a lot of trash tucked inside his closet, thick face, and a person with dubious ways. Whether or not the subject article constitute qualified privilege communication. Held ES, absolute and qualified privilege communication, the questioned article dealt with matters of public interest as the declared objective of the conference, the composition of its members and participants, and the manner by which it was intended to be funded, no doubt. Led to its activities as being genuinely imbued with public interest. Borhal's writing are not within the exceptions of Article 354 of RPC. Article 354 is not an exclusive list of qualifiedly privileged communications. The rule on privileged communications had its genesis not in the nation's penal code but in the Bill of Rights of the Constitution guaranteeing freedom of speech and of the press. The concept of privileged communication is implicit in the freedom of the press and that privileged communications must be protective of public opinion. <coughs> Fair commentaries on matters of public interest are privileged and constitute a valid defense in action for libel or slander. The doctrine of fair comment means that while in general, every discreditable in imputation publicly made is deemed false because every man is presumed innocent until his guilt is judicially proved and every false imputation is deemed malicious. Nevertheless, when the discreditable information is directed against a public person in his public capacity, it is not necessarily actionable in order that such discreditable imp imputation to a public official may be actionable. It must either be a false allegation of fact or a comment based on a false supposition. If the comment is an expression of opinion based on established facts, then it is immaterial that the opinion happens to be mistaken as long as it might reasonably be inferred from the facts. The question article dealt with matters of public interest as the declared objective of the conference, the composition of its members and participants, and the manner by which it was intended to be funded, no doubt lend to its activities as being being generally imbued with public interest. Respondent is also deemed to be a public figure and even otherwise is involved in a public issue. The court held that the freedom of expression was constitutionally guaranteed and protected with a reminder among media members to practice highest ethical standards and the exercise thereof. In Reyes v. Bagaching, petitioner sought a permit from the city of Manila to hold a peaceful march and rally 
<coughs> on October 1983 from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. in the afternoon, starting from Luneta to the gates of the United States Embassy. Once there and in an, in an open space of public property, a short program would be held. The march would be attended by the local and foreign participants of such conference. And that would be followed by the handing over of a petition <sighs> based on the resolution adopted at the closing session of the Anti-Basis Coalition. There was likewise an assurance in the petition that in the exercise of the constitutional rights of free speech and assembly, all the necessary steps would be taken by it to ensure a peaceful march and rally. However, the request was denied. Reference was made to persistent Intelligence reports affirming the plans of subversive criminal elements to infiltrate or disrupt any assembly or congregations where a large number of people is expected to attend. The issue is whether or not freedom of expression and the right to peaceably assemble was violated. Yes, the invocation of the right to freedom of assembly carries with it the implication that the right to free speech has likewise been disregarded. It is settled law that as to public places, especially so as to parks and streets, there is freedom of access, nor is their use dependent on who is the applicant for the permit, whether an individual or a group. There can be no uh, legal objection, absent the existence of a clear and present danger of a substantive evil on the choice of Luneta as the place where the peace rally would start. The e-memorial Luneta has been used for purposes of assembly, communicating thoughts between citizens and discussing public questions. In Miller v. California, Marvin Miller is an owner of a business that distributed pornographic books and films. He mailed advertising materials containing explicit sexual imagery. The owner of a restaurant and his mother opened an envelope containing these materials and alerted the police. Miller was alerted, charged, and convicted under California law banning these obscene materials. The law was crafted to comply with the essay decision on obscenity and First Amendment in Roth v. U.S. In the trial, the judge had instructed the jury to use the community standards of California in determining whether the materials would be considered obscene. Miller argued that this failed to comply with the essay decision in Memoirs v. Massachusetts. The appellate court rejected this argument. In Roth v. U.S., um, decided that uh, First Amendment did not protect obscene materials as such as utterly without redeeming social importance. Roth presumes obscenity to be without social importance, but memoirs goes against the idea and overturns the Roth standard. The memoirs versus Massachusetts case stated that, that there is a test of obscenity. It must be established that the dominant theme of the material taken as a whole appeals to a prurient interest in sex. The material is patently offensive because it affronts contemporary community standards relating to the description of representation of sexual matters and... Oh, uh, material is utterly without redeeming social value. And the issue is whether or not applying community standards is sufficient in determining the obscenity of matters. Held, no, it is sufficient to apply merely community standards. The court reiterated that the First Amendment does not protect obscene speech and hardcore pornography, but created a, sub a standard for determining whether a material is obscene. All three factors had to be satisfied for the speech to give rise to criminal liability as obscene matter. The three factors are whether the average person applying contemporary community standards would find that the work as a whole appeals to the period interest, whether the work depicts or describes sexual conduct or executory functions as defined by the state of law in an offensive way, and whether the work as a whole lacks serious literacy, artistic, political, or scientific value. Held, it is uh, this established that in freedom of speech and the freedom of the courts must remain sensitive to any infringement on any genuinely serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific expression. In PETA v. Court of Appeals in 1983, elements of the anti uh, spe special anti-narcotic groups, a narcotics group and the Manila police seized and confiscated from dealers along Manila sidewalks. Magazines believed to be obscene. These were later burned. One of the publications was Pinoy Playboy published by Leo Pita. 
he filed an injunction case against the mayor of Manila to enjoin him from confiscating more copies of his magazine and claimed that this was a violation of freedom of speech. The court ordered him to show cause. He then filed an urgent motion for issuance of a temporary restraining order against indiscriminate seizure. Defendant Mayor Bagaching admitted the confiscation and burning of obscene reading materials but admitted that these were surrendered by the stall owners and the establishments were not raided. The other defendant, WPD Superintendent Narcisco Cabrera, filed no answer. On January 11, 1984, the trial court issued an order setting the case for hearing on January 16, 1984, for the parties to adduce evidence on the question of whether the publication, Pinoy Playboy magazine alleged seized, confiscated, and or burned by the defendants are obscene per se or not. Facts On February 3, 1984, the trial court promulgated the order appealed from denying the motion for a writ of preliminary injunction and dismissing the case for lack of merit. <coughs> The CA also dismissed the appeal due to the uh, argument that the freedom of press is not without restraint. The petitioner claimed that the CA erred in holding that the police officers could, without any court warrant or order, seize and confiscate petitioner's magazines on the basis simply of the dirt, their determination and they are obscene. The Court of Appeals erred in affirming the decision of the trial court and in effect holding that the trial court could dismiss the case on its merits without any hearing thereon when was, when what was submitted to it for resolution was merely the application of petitioner for the writ of preliminary injunction. Whether or not the, ish, the um, seizure violative of the freedom of expression in the petitioner no, as strongly stressed in Bagaching, a case involving the delivery of political speech, the presumption is that the speech may validly be said. The burden is on the state to demonstrate the existence of a danger. A danger must not only be clear but also present to justify state to, um, <coughs> action to stop the speech. Meanwhile, the government must allow it. It has no choice, however, if it acts notwithstanding that the absence of evidence of a clear and present danger, it must come to terms with and be held accountable for due process. <coughs> the court is not convinced that the private respondents have shown the required proof to justify a ban and to warrant confiscation of the literature for which mandatory injunction had been sought below. First of all, they were not possessed of a lawful court order finding the said materials to be pornography and the author and authorizing them to carry out a see, search and seizure by way of a search warrant. The fact that the former Respondent Mayor's Act was sanctioned by police officer is no license to seize property in disregard of due process. In Philippine Service Exporters Incorporated v. Drilon, the court defined police power as the state authority to enact legislation that may interfere with personal liberty or property in order to promote the general welfare. Presidential Decree Numbers 960 and 969 are arguably police power measures, but they are not by themselves authorities for high-handed acts. They do not exempt our law enforcers in carrying out the decree of the twin presidential issuances from the commandments of the Constitution, the right to due process of law, and the right against unreasonable searches and seizures, specifically. In the case of Iglesia Nicriso v. Court of Appeals, Petitioner Iglesia Nicriso, a duly organized religious organization, has a television program entitled Ang Iglesia Nicriso, aired every Saturday and Sunday. The program presents the propagates petitioner's beliefs, doctrines, and practices oftentimes in comparative studies with other religion. Sometime in September 1992, petitioners submitted to the Respondent Board of Review for moving pictures and television VTR tapes of several of its TV program series. The board classified the series as X for not uh, or not for public viewing on the ground that they offend and constitute an attack against other religions, which is expressly prohibited by law. On December 14, 1992, petitioner filed a case against the Respondent Board RTC of Quezon City alleging that the board acted without jurisdiction or with grave abuse of discretion in requiring petitioner to submit the VTR tapes of some of its TV programs and in X-rating them. 
the RTCQC rendered judgment in favor of the petitioner. The respondent board appealed to the CA where it reversed the decision of the trial court. The CA ruled that the board um, has jurisdiction and power to review the TV program, Ang Iglesia Ni Cristo, hence the petition for review at the Supreme Court. The issue is whether or not a religious TV program is protected by the Constitution under its freedom of expression provision, which qualifies all of its broadcasts exempted from any review. No, a religious TV program is not protected by the Constitution under its freedom of expression provision, which qualifies all of its broadcasts accepted from any review. Section 5 of Article 3 of the Constitution guarantees that no law shall be made respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The free exercise and enjoyment of religious profession and worship without discrimination or preference shall forever be allowed. The right to religious profession and worship has a twofold aspects, the freedom to believe and the freedom to act on one's beliefs. Television is a medium that reaches out the eyes and ears of children. The court reiterates the rule that the exercise of the religious freedom can be regulated by the state when it will bring about the clear and present danger of some substantive evil which the state is uh, duty-bound to prevent. It is also opined that it is inappropriate to apply the clear and present danger test to the case at bar because the issue involves the content of speech and not the time, place, or manner of speech. The evidence shows that the respondent board X-rated petitioner's TV series for attacking either religions, especially the Catholic Church, an examination of the evidence will show that the so-called attacks are mere criticisms of some of the deeply held dogmas and tenets of other religions. The contention overlooks the fact that the case at bar involves videotapes that are pre-taped and hence their speech content is known and not an X quantity. And therefore, a religious TV program is not protected by the Constitution under its freedom of expression provision, which qualifies all of its broadcasts exempted from any review. In the case of Social Weather Stations Incorporated versus Comelec, SWS filed an action for prohibition to enjoin the Commission on Election from enforcing RA 9006 or Fair Election Act, which provides service affecting national candidates shall not be published 15 days before an election and service affecting local candidates shall not be published 7 days before an election. Petitioners argue that the restriction on the publication of election survey results constitutes a prior restraint and the exercise of freedom of speech without any clear and present danger to justify such restraint. They claim that SWS and other pollster conducted and published the results of surveys prior to the 1992, 1995, and 1998 elections up to as close as two days before the election day without causing confusion among the voters and that there is neither empirical nor historical evidence to support the conclusion that there is an immediate and inevitable danger to tile voting process posed by election surveys. Comelec justifies the restrictions in Section 5 of RA 9006 as necessary to prevent the manipulation and corruption of the electoral process by unscrupulous and erroneous service just before the election. The issue is whether or not Section 5.4 of RA 9006 constitute an unconstitutional abridgment of speech of expression and the press. Yes, any system of prior restraints of expression comes to this court bearing a heavy presumption against its constitutional validity. The government thus carries a heavy burden of showing justification for the purpose of such restraint. Government regulation is um, sufficiently justified. If it is within the constitutional power of the government, if it furthers an important or substantial government interest, if the governmental interest is unrelated to the suppression of free expression, and if the incidental restriction on alleged First Amendment freedom of speech, expression, and press is no greater than is essential to the furtherance of that interest. Held under O'Brien test, even if a law furthers an important or substantial government interest, it should be invalidated if such governmental interest is not unrelated to the expression of free expression. 
Moreover, even if the purpose is unrelated to the suppression of free expression, the law should nevertheless be invalidated if the restriction on freedom of expression is greater than is necessary to achieve the governmental purpose in question. To summarize then, we hold that Section 5.4 is invalid because um, 1. It imposes a prior restraint on the freedom of expression and number 2. It is a direct and total suppression of a category of expression even though such suppression is only for a limited period. The governmental interest sought to be promoted can be achieved by means other than suppression of freedom of expression.